Vamos a comenzar con, con la segunda parte de este seminario, con la presentación de Tom Orlick. Tom, are you there? I think you are in. Yes, But yes, I am. I've you're, been, uh, you're there. How are you, Tom? I'm good. I've, I've been listening for the last few minutes, and it's given me an opportunity to confirm that I don't speak or understand Spanish. Okay, well, that's a very important step to take. So... Welcome to, to San Andres. Welcome to this seminar. We are very happy to have you here with us. Um, we, I'm going to introduce you a bit to the audience in Spanish and then we shift back to English if you want. Um, uh, Tom is a chief, a jefe economista, economista jefe de Bloomberg. Um, tiene una enorme experiencia eh, cubriendo Asia. Él eh, vivió cerca de 10 años en China, ha escrito dos libros sobre China, uno entendiendo los indicadores económicos de China, y el otro, China, la burbuja que nunca eh, revienta, la burbuja que nunca estalla, the bubble that never pop, eh, publicado hace dos o tres meses. Eh, así que Tom nos va a dar, Tom, you are going to give us a very global perspective on 5G and how this, you know, this issue fits into security, economics, power, and very interesting and complex dimensions. So the floor is yours, the Zoom is yours uh, for about 20 minutes, and then we move back to questions and answers from the audience. Tom? Great, well, well thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to, to speak. So uh, I'm going to take a step back um, and talk a bit about the, the broader US-China relationship um, and uh, hopefully draw out some uh, implications for uh, the outlook for the US, for China, um, and for the global uh, technology supply chain, including questions like 5G and Huawei. Um, so, um, Let me start by sharing some of the kind of the big background uh, on US-China relations. Um, so um, broadly speaking, uh, I would say that from uh, George Bush Sr. through Bill Clinton, through George Bush Jr., uh, through Barack Obama, uh, the US pursued a policy of uh, welcoming China into the global community, welcoming China into the global markets. Um, under President Donald Trump, of course, um, the situation has significantly changed. Um, the US now views China um, as, uh, at a minimum, uh, a strategic competitor, uh, and in some respects, um, as an adversary. Um, so, uh, so what's happened Uh, to change the U.S. view? Um, well, I, I think there's three things. Um, so, um, firstly, China has just got bigger much more quickly. Um, it was all very well welcoming China into the global economy in 1999, when China was just a, a couple of percent of global GDP. Um, it's quite another thing to welcome China into the global economy in 2020, uh, when China is rapidly catching up with the United States, and based on our projections, will probably overtake the United States and become the world's biggest economy around the middle of the 2030s. Um, the second reason is that US hopes for reform in China um, have uh, proved to be unfounded. Um, if you go back to the 1990s um, and the early 2000s, there was hope not just that China would pursue market reforms, um, but also that China would pursue democratic reforms. Uh, and there were some indications that they were moving in that direction. On the market, um, Zhu Rongji, uh, China's premier, uh, engaged in a significant program of privatizations, selling off state-owned enterprises, On politics, well, China never moved very far towards democracy, um, but there were experiments with things like village elections. There were experiments with um, a larger role for civil society and a free press. 
Um, under Xi Jinping, uh, both of those trends have, have stopped and in some respects reversed. Uh, Xi Jinping has said he wants state-owned enterprises which are bigger, better and stronger. Um, Xi Jinping has certainly not shifted uh, China onto, onto a democratic trajectory. Uh, indeed, in many respects, China is more authoritarian now than it was 20 years ago. Uh, so hopes for a reform in China on the economy and on politics uh, have not come to uh, fruition. Um, and then finally, uh, I think China itself has made some mistakes. Um, for a long time, China's international relations strategy uh, was characterized by that famous phrase from Deng Xiaoping, um, we should bide our time and hide our strength. Um, under Xi Jinping, uh, that's changed and China has announced its arrival as a global power. The Belt and Road Initiative announces China's arrival as a force in international relations. The China 2025 strategy announces China's arrival as a manufacturing, industrial, technological power. Um, and these things have alarmed the rest of the world, right? Um, and they've helped catalyze the shift in view uh, in the US, in Europe, in Australia, and elsewhere. Um, so, so the view in the US has shifted uh, from welcoming China to viewing China uh, as a threat. Um, and, and that's now showing up in lots of different places. Um, it showed up first in a trade war in 2018 and 2019. Um, the U.S. imposed tariffs on hundreds of billions of, uh, of Chinese goods, um, imposed sanctions on Chinese technology companies, including uh, Huawei and ZTE, um, and uh, forced China uh, to sign a trade deal uh, where China agreed to significantly increase its purchases of U.S. goods, as well as providing more protections for intellectual property uh, and more market access. Um, as you can see in this chart, um, because of the COVID shock, China is significantly underperforming its targets uh, for buying US products. Um, and that's an additional reason to expect tensions to increase. Um, so the conflict started with trade, um, but it's now spilled out to a range of different issues. Uh, so we have sanctions on technology companies. Uh, we have sanctions on companies which do business in Xinjiang, uh, the center of concern about human rights abuses in China. Uh, we have sanctions on Chinese officials uh, in Hong Kong, um, the site of new concerns about the kind of the expansion of mainland China's authoritarian approach um, to a former colony that once had a rather liberal and open uh, political culture. Um, uh, we have consulates closing. The US has closed the Chinese consulate um, in Houston, accusing it of being a center of, of spying and espionage. Uh, and China retaliated um, with the closure of a US consulate uh, in Chengdu. So it's not just trade. Across a broad range of issues, trade, technology, research, human rights, uh, there's now a kind of a broad and deep conflict between China and the United States. Um, this quote from US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, I think, highlights the depth of negative feeling that there is about China at the top levels of the US government. Uh, here's what Pompeo says. Um, it's this ideology that informs Xi Jinping's decades-long desire for global hegemony of Chinese communism. America can no longer ignore the fundamental political and ideological differences between our countries. Um, so this doesn't sound like a man who's looking to uh, resolve differences and move relations onto a positive trajectory. Uh, this sounds like a man um, who views China as a kind of an existential threat, a country which the US really can't have a positive relationship with. And that's a view which is not just Mike Pompeo's view, it's a view which is fairly widely shared uh, across, um, US, across the US political spectrum. Um, 
Now, one of the mistakes I think which uh, which we make in here in the U.S. is we uh, is we kind of pretend that um, it's the U.S. who has agency, the U.S. that makes decisions, the U.S. that, that decides if we want to be friends with China or not, and China is kind of the passive partner. China wants to be friends, but um, if we're not going to be friends, there's nothing they can really do about it. The reality, of course, is that China has agency. China is making decisions. China is also deciding how close they want to be to the US and how close they want to be to the rest of the world. Um, and the signals from China's leadership suggest that they are also pulling back from the relationship. China's leadership are increasingly convinced that their political and economic model uh, is the right one. They don't see any need to reform, democratize, move towards a more market-based system. Um, and they increasingly see risks from their codependent relationship with the United States. You might have heard the idea of a dual circulation economy, the new buzzword from, from Xi Jinping and his advisors. Um, and essentially what that buzzword means the idea of a dual circulation economy is that China should become more self-reliant, less dependent on foreign technology, less dependent uh, on foreign finance. Uh, so the big question, uh, of course, uh, is, is what happens going forwards? Um, we have a, a, a critical decision point uh, in November here in the United States, uh, the US presidential election. Um, now, uh, it's possible that uh, President Trump will win a second term, in which case we would expect an accelerating deterioration in US-China relations. Um, more likely, though, at least based on the latest uh, opinion polls, is that um, Joe Biden will win. Um, and we'll have someone else here in DC in charge of managing US-China relations. Um, so what could US-China relations look like under a Biden presidency? Um, well, to answer that question, uh, we've, we've put together this kind of, this simple conceptual map of the US approach to China. Um, and what we've done is we've put the Obama, Trump, and potential future Biden administrations uh, on this grid. Um, on the x-axis, you have US strategy. Um, on the right, you have a strategy of engagement. On the left, you have a strategy of containment. On the y-axis, you have ta US tactics, which can be narrow and procedural and predictable at the top, or broad, unpredictable, and wild at the bottom. So in the top right, you see the Obama administrations. Broadly speaking, they followed a strategy of engagement, and they pursued narrow, predictable, procedural tactics. In the bottom left, you see the Trump administration, um, and of course, there's been a complete reversal. The strategy has gone from engagement to containment, and the tactics have gone from narrow, predictable, and procedural to broad and completely unpredictable. What would a Biden presidency look like? Uh, well, that's the blue dot. Um, and we think that the Biden, a, a future Biden administration uh, would move back towards a more balanced approach. We wouldn't go all the way back to the friendly proceduralism of the Obama administration, but we wouldn't be so wild and unpredictable or as hostile uh, as we currently are uh, under the Trump administration. So our base case is that come 2021, the guardrails come back on to the US-China relationship. It's not as friendly as it was, as it once was, but it's not nearly as hostile uh, as it currently is. That's our base case, um, but things won't necessarily play out that way. Um, so we've also spent some time modeling a scenario uh, of US-China decoupling. Um, so what we did um, was we looked at the relationship between um, trade, technology transfer, and potential growth. So we looked at the way in which trade and technology transfer boosts productivity and creates incentives for capital spending. Um, and then we interacted those calculations with our long-term forecasts uh, for Chinese and US growth. 
Um, and we looked at two scenarios. We looked at a scenario where the US decouples from China on its own. So a kind of a unilateral US decoupling. And we looked at a scenario where the US brings its allies with it. So a scenario where a future President Biden or a second term uh, President Trump picks up the phone to Tokyo and Seoul and Brussels and uh, London and Berlin uh, and persuades leaders there that they should pursue a unified decoupling strategy from China. Um, so in the first scenario where we have unilateral decoupling, so the US-China relationship breaks down, um, but China retains its relationships with everyone else, we see China's potential growth going from around 4.5% in 2030 down to around 3.5% in 2030. Um, so a cost for China, but not a catastrophic cost. Uh, and the intuition there is that if China still has good relations with Japan and Korea and Germany and the UK, they've still got places they can absorb technology from, they've still got markets they can sell to. So the breakdown in relations with the US is bad, but it's not catastrophic. The real disaster for Beijing uh, would be if um, the US succeeded in bringing its allies along with it and persuaded Japan and Korea and European countries that they should all decouple from China. They should all block the, the flow of technology and ideas from their universities and their businesses into the Chinese market. If that happens, then China's potential growth goes all the way from 4.5% uh, down to uh, below 2%. So a very serious blow uh, for China's growth potential. Um, so our base case is actually that we don't see anything which looks like comprehensive decoupling. Um, that a future Biden administration or uh, a second term Trump administration um, maintains the sort of the core elements of the trade relationship. Uh, and actually, we saw in 2018 and 2019 that even as the Trump administration put tariffs on toys and clothes and um, a bunch of different things, they did not put tariffs on electronics. Um, and that's really important uh, because it's electronics where China plays the biggest role um, in the global economy and where the links between China and the US, China and the Europe, China and the rest of the world are most intense. To illustrate that, um, let me share um, one of the sort of the insights that you can glean from, from the Bloomberg terminal. Um, so one of the things we do at Bloomberg is we map all of the relationships between listed companies. So we can map the supply chain and the customers for all uh, listed companies using publicly available data. Um, so in this illustration, I put Apple at the center of the map. Uh, and what you can see is that all of China's, all of Apple's suppliers on the left come from Asia and many of them come from China. So a kind of a comprehensive decoupling between China and the United States um, would effectively break Apple's supply chain. And of course, it would, it would break the supply chain for basically all of the big technology companies. Um, that would come not just at a cost to long-term growth, it would come at an immediate cost to short-term growth. We would see a fierce sell-off in financial markets, we would see losses for major US companies. Um, and for that reason, um, even as the latest news remains alarming, even as um, the US election increases the temperature, increases the stress on US-China relations, ultimately, we think that the ties are too binding uh, to completely break. 